So anyway, this is my friend. This is Pastor Mike Rosas. He's going to bless you today because God gave him a word for you. For the church, for our nation. So let's stand and let's receive Pastor Mike Rosas this morning. I appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Uh, it is a, a huge, huge honor to be here with y'all. Um, thank you, Pastor Zelvin and Sabrina. It's a huge, huge blessing. The whole church family. If you don't mind, can we bow our heads and close our eyes? We'll start with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you because you are great and greatly to be praised. God, your love is abundant, Father, and overwhelming. Father, there is no God like Jehovah. And this morning we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal Jesus like Jesus did on the, with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. God, that as we hear about Jesus, that our hearts would burn within us, that we would draw closer to you, Father, that we would know you as you want to be known. Mm -hmm. God, we love you, Father. And in this moment, Lord God, where a nation is on fire, mm -hmm. only you are mighty to save. So I pray this morning would be encouraged, strengthened, and challenged to walk in everything you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, we'll be starting out in Psalms. I, um, I love the scriptures. I love the word of God. And I always say the same thing. It's more important we remember what he says rather than what, than what anything I have to say. So if you want to go to your Bible, Psalms 116, verse 2. I am a, a big fan of memes. Do we have any fans of memes? Some of y'all enjoy memes. I, I, I'm in good company. Um, there's a meme that came out, actually came out in 2020, that really caught my attention. And it was a dog drinking coffee in a cafe that's burning down. How many of y'all remember that meme? It's a, it's a funny meme, but in the first one, he says, this is fine, is literally the cafe is burning down around him. In the next scene, his chair in the table. Oh, there it is. Yes, this is it. <laughs> so it's, it's a little graphic as you get towards the end. Um, but he says at the end, that's okay. Things are going to be okay as he burns to death. <laughs> and so I, I put myself in the shoes of the dog and I said, what could he really do in that situation? I came up with three options. The first option is what he did. He just drank coffee until his death saying, this is fine. This is fine. And the second option was that he could have, to the best of his ability, ran to the back and filled a, a trash can with water and tried to put out the fire himself. I don't know how good you could do with a 2,000 square foot coffee shop and a can of water. The third thing he could have done, though, is he could have taken out what he probably had. If the dog is drinking coffee, I imagine the dog also has a cell phone. He could have called the fire department, <laughs> called the professionals, to come and to take out the fire, do what they do, and save the day. And can I tell you, church, that we as a church in America are in the same place today. America is on fire. Yes, it is. And we have three choices. Our first choice is to continue to do what we're doing. To go to church Sunday morning and live our life Monday through Saturday as if it's our own and act like this is okay, everything's going to be okay. Our second option is to the best of our ability, we can do everything we think we can do to make America a better place and try to save it. And much like a dog with a 2,000 square foot coffee shop, I would imagine is my opportunity to save a nation that's on fire by myself. Right. It's not looking good. Yeah. Yeah. The third option though, is I can call upon the name that's above all names. I can call upon the one who is mighty to save and invite him into this situation to do what only he can can do. Yes. And church, that is what we're presented with today. Psalms 116, 2 says, because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Because the king of the universe, the one that the Bible says sits upon the circle of the earth, that he sits upon the throne in heaven, that the earth is his footstool. Heaven itself can't contain him. He is the one who humbles himself and he bends down his ear to hear my small, broken, frail voice. And yet God and his divinity and his, and his omnipotence, he, he humbles himself to not only hear our prayers, but to work with and through the church. And you have to understand the only vehicle that biblically God works on the earth is his church. 
So we are invited into this place of working and partnering with God to see heaven come down to earth. But there's this, there's this word, it's very powerful, even though it's only two letters, and it's the word if. It's the word if. Why? Because if has, it has potential. It's pregnant with purpose, but if not fulfilled, it is nothing but that word if. We can think about what could have happened, but if we don't do the work, let me tell you, church, nothing will happen. And so we're placed here where it says, because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. And if God's people pray, let me tell you, God answers. I remember one day me and my wife are, are notorious night owls. And we go to sleep very, very late, usually between midnight and one every night. And I remember this one time I was so stressed out with the anxieties of what we were doing in Colombia, the work that we're doing in America. I was so overwhelmed. I literally became incapacitated. And I told my wife, I said, I cannot take it anymore. I have to go to sleep. So at 8 p.m., I roll into my bed and I fall asleep. And I remember early that morning around 4 a.m., God literally rolls me out of bed onto my knees and I fall in a prayer motion at the side of my bed. And God says something I'll never forget. He says, son, you are not powerless. You are prayerless. I was taking this heavy burden on my shoulders that was far too much for me to carry. And God says, just hand it over. I think there's enough room on my pinky to deal with it. And so the all-powerful one was limited, not by his ability to save, but by my ability to call upon the Savior. Yeah. If, what will happen if the church begins to pray? If you have your Bibles, I want you to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible and one that Pastor Elvin already shared with. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and will pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And this is one of those, this is one of those game-changing verses that start off with that powerful two-letter word, if. And, and, and if I can be honest, I've been to a ton of Second Chronicles 714 conferences. And in these conferences, we go and we begin to pray for the nation. God, forgive us for abortion. God, forgive us for pornography. God, forgive us for murder and crime and all these things. And all which are biblical and powerful prayers. But that's not what the verse says. What the verse says is this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. We've been so busy praying for the sins of America that we've forgotten about the skeletons in our own closet. And when we remember that judgment starts in the house, we remember that God, when he moves, first looks to his remnant before he looks to any lost person. The, the lost are going to do lost things. I'm going to give you some homework. Read Psalms 82, one of my favorite chapters. I've been preaching on it for the last decade. But people that are in the dark are going to do dark things. That never surprises God. What surprises God is the inactivity of the church that he has covenant with. Pastor Elvin preached at our church, and it was, I'll be honest, it was a complete game changer for me. Because I had heard a lot of friends who had ministered in Las Vegas, and they said, Las Vegas, it's the city of sin. It's a lost city. It's such a tough city to minister in. You can't do great works there because there's so much sin. And yet Pastor Elvin, when they introduced him, Pastor, uh, Pastor Elvin said, I'm from Las Vegas, the city of grace. <laughs> because wherever sin abounds, come on church, grace does much more. See, and it's that context, which I'm so thrilled that y'all are under sound pastorship and teaching here at the house, is because one word can change everything. Amen. When you are taken apart from the chains of, oh, this is sin city, it's just what they do here, to know this is now grace city. This is a place that's primed for miracles. Now, from instead of being enslaved to the sin that's around me, I'm now empowered to be the answer to prayers that say, God, I need you, but they're really poured out through sex and drugs and murder. They're calling out for God, they just don't know his name. Until we, the church, represent him, or better said, we re-present him to the world. 
And so God is calling us. He's saying, if my people, if I can get my people to deal with what's in their house, then I can deal with what's in the White House. If I can get my people to deal with what's in their house, then like John the Baptist who prays, prepare the way of the Lord, the, the way the Lord comes is on the hearts of his sons and daughters. And so when we prepare the Lord's way in us, then he moves through us. And in the Old Testament, when David kills Goliath, the Holy Spirit came upon him. In the New Testament, he comes within us and he stays he doesn't visit. He makes a habitation. So we instantly have inside of us the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. The impossible made possible is constantly inside of the believers. So what does that mean? That means every moment I'm breathing is pregnant with purpose. Every moment that I choose to agree with God is now a moment that's pregnant with the opportunity to see the miraculous overtake the natural. I am not enslaved to my circumstances. My circumstances have to be submitted to the king that I serve. So I come as an ambassador bringing the kingdom to whatever nation I find myself in. And so now we find ourselves in this place called America and God is looking to us and he's saying, what will you do with this Holy Spirit that I gave you? Now, I, I want you to think about it for a second. For three years, the Messiah, Hillsong calls him the darling of heaven. Jesus Christ comes and spends time with the disciples. How many of you think you'd be encouraged if Jesus came and mentored you for three years? You would be empowered, right? You would be able to see, like the disciples, the impossible become impossible. And yet Jesus looks them in their eyes and he says, it's better that I go so that he can come. Do you understand what is within you? It's game changing if we will choose to call upon him and then obey him. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now I want to stop right here real quick. These are harsh words. And one of the things you have to understand about understanding the Bible is that you have to keep the word in its context. Because if you take the text out of the context, all you're left with is a con. And so Jesus, the Messiah, is the one who's saying these harsh words. That you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So the guy that we see pictured wearing a white dress and carrying a lamb is not an effeminate character. Jesus is a very powerful leader. Amen. And he challenges us to follow him, and not just to follow him, but to be fruitful with him. Yes. Verse 14 says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, my, my wife's an amazing cook. I don't have that grace. I have more of the grace of eating what she cooks. And so I, I, I enjoy food, but the, the Holy Spirit had me search this out. And I found, I found out that salt has two main characteristics. Salt has two jobs that it does. Salt has the job of blocking bad flavors and accentuating good flavors. That's what salt has to do. Jesus said, if it doesn't do that, then it's good for nothing. So let me tell you what salt's job isn't. Salt's job isn't to stay in the salt canister Sunday morning and then go hang out with food and then come back to the salt canister the next Sunday. The job of salt is to go out into the world and to be used. It is our job. Now, I, I thank God for the American dream. My family's from Colombia. My wife's family's from Mexico. And we thank God for the American dream that allows us to go out and to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But we can get so caught up on the American dream that we forget that we were saved and born again for heaven's dream. Yeah. And heaven's dream is what Jesus came to bring on this earth when he stretched out his hands on the cross and he said, it is finished. But he also said, tag, you're in. Yeah. 
I don't know how many of y'all remember the, the wrestling from the 80s and the 90s, the, the Hulk Hogan, right? And Hulk Hogan would come and he'd get overtaken by the enemy. And then what would happen is he would go and he would tap, tap in his partner and his partner would come in. Now, Jesus, the great thing about him is that he overcame the enemy for you. He said, I just need somebody to occupy till I come. I need somebody to enforce the victory till I come and make it final and complete. And so Jesus is telling us as a church, it is your job to be salt. It is your job to be light. It's not our job to sit on the sidelines and wait for Jesus to come and win it all. And then we go and pour the Gatorade on his head. No, Jesus invites us onto the field to play our part, to represent him. So when the enemy sees you, he sees him. When the enemy sees you, he thinks, oh, I, I, thought, I thought I killed him already and resurrected and he went to heaven. But here he is again in human form. I, I have been, I, myself and my, my beautiful wife, my better half, we were praying with some friends. We were praying for America. We were praying in the spirit and we, we were just, just seeing wherever God led us. And as I was praying, I was reminded of this quote that I hadn't heard in close to a decade. It was this quote, this quote by the historian, by the theologian, Walter Wink. And it says this, it says, history belongs to the intercessor. History belongs to the intercessor. The God who humbles his ear in Psalms 116 to hear our prayer in his omnipotence and his omniscience and his all powerful being, he chooses to limit himself to work through and with us to get his work done here on the earth. So what happens, the passage of time is affected and infected by the son or daughter of God who chooses to partner with heaven and believe God to do what only God can do. History belongs to to the intercessor. In, I believe it was the 1800s, we saw America get a, a, a economic collapse. And the, the major bank in Philadelphia went bankrupt. And this gentleman named Jeremy Lamphere, he went in New York and he began to pray. And he began to pray. And nobody prayed with him for the first 30 minutes. And then people slowly began to trickle in. And then every week he began to do this prayer session. And it became so much so that this prayer session came and it filled, touched millions of people all over America. And a revival came that so impacted Christian businessmen and businesswomen that they were able to change the course of America. In Wales, in one year, they saw 10% of the nation come to Christ when Evan Roberts and his group of, of believers said, God, bend me. Before we ever see a great move of God, we always see great prayer by God's people. And I believe America is on the verge of one of the greatest moves of God this nation has ever seen. Another great awakening. If, hear me church, if the church will pray. How many of you have heard the church is a sleeping giant? Let me tell you, a midget on his knees can beat a sleeping giant. That doesn't say anything, but there's potential. And potential isn't anything until it's fulfilled. And what we're calling the church to do is to wake up. Why? Because there is so much power when we pray and we call upon the name of the Lord. I want you to go in your Bibles to Acts chapter 12, verse 1. I'm going to read you a large portion of Scripture. But I want you to see what happens when the church prays. I'm going to read you 17 verses straight, so put your seatbelts on and let's, get, let's jump into this. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real. But he thought he was seeing a vision. 
When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it's his angel. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. This is a very powerful, game-changing story. King Herod, he goes and he takes one of the apostles in this Jesus movement that's gaining a lot of steam, and he kills him. Why? Because it pleases a certain people group. That's a political spirit. Politicians will do things to please people group, whether it is just or unjust. That is why it's important for us to pray for politicians. And they go and they kill James, one of the apostles. And then the Bible says, and then he stretched out his hand to Peter. And so the Bible goes on to show us that Peter lives. So what was the difference between James being murdered and Peter living? Verse 4 tells us that. Verse 4 says... So when he had arrested him, he put him, I'm sorry, verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Amen. Everybody say constant prayer. Constant prayer. James was murdered. Constant prayer was done by the church, and Peter was saved. If my people pray. If my people don't pray... The Bible tells us, the Bible doesn't mention anything about church praying, and we see James die. And then the Bible says the church was in constant prayer, and then Peter was saved. Wow. We will never know what will happen when the church doesn't pray. But we have no idea the potential of what will happen when the church does pray. And so God challenges us and he invites us into this supernatural story. I want you to keep reading with me. I want you to go to verse 7. Verse 7 says, Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side, and he raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hand. And, and what I want to teach you in verse 7 is that obedience precedes freedom. Freedom does not precede obedience. Oh. Say that again. Obedience precedes freedom. Freedom does not precede obedience. Yeah. Peter, the angel says, you're free. And Peter's like, I'm still in my chains. But when he took the word of the Lord and he moved in action in faith, then the chains fell off. Too many of us are waiting for perfect circumstances to do the work of the Lord. And the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, if you do that, then you'll never sow. If you're waiting for the perfect circumstances to share the gospel with a family member, they'll never come. Satan will, will move hell and high water to make sure the perfect circumstances never come. Do you know 66% of people in one of the latest Barna polls shows that they would go to church if, everybody say if, if they were invited. I, I'm 40 years old. And in my life, I grew up in some, I guess Houston's part of the Bible Belt. I'm 40 years old. Never once in my life has anybody come up to me outside of church and say, do you know Jesus? In 40 years. Beautiful are the feet of those who go. Verse 14. It says, When she recognized Peter's voice because of her, ran out Rhoda. I'm sorry, uh, verse 13. As, as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. Now, verse 13 is very powerful because out of everyone that was there, the Bible says that the whole church was in constant prayer. All these well-known people that had come to Christ, but the only name recorded in the Bible is a servant girl, Rhoda. Why is that important? Because out of everyone who was there, only her name was recorded. Unbelief doesn't put your name in the history books. Belief does. There's a lot of naysayers that are like, oh, well, this is happening and this is happening. And let me tell you, their names will never be in the history books. The names that will be put in the history books are the one who take God at his word and believe. There was, there was other apostles there. 
I'm sure there was pastors there. There were some prophets there. There were some teachers there. There were some, some apostles there. There were all these things, but only Rhoda's name was recognized. Why? Because the highest title that's valued in heaven is son and daughter. Amen. And God puts us all in the same playing field. But what separates us is those who choose to believe. You want to impact history? Believe God. Call upon the name of the Lord. Go in prayer. Why? So will we not be known as a powerless people, but as a prayerful people? Yes. People that, that, that move the needle here in Las Vegas because we choose to believe and take God at his word. And we call upon the name of the Lord and the Lord moves when his name is called. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to go to verse 15. And it says, but they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, oh, it's just his angel. What I want you to understand is this, is that those who don't believe usually don't do. They were praying for Peter. God, free Peter. God, move. God, do something supernatural. Somebody was like, God, send an angel to free Peter. And he was like, oh, that'll never happen. And then it happens, and Peter is there knocking at their door, and they are just going through the motions. How many know you can go to church without being the church? And we are here in this place, and we're like, God, I know you can turn around America. And God's like, okay, well, if you believe that, well, then pray and invite me in. Guys, I'm telling you, some of the things you're about to see are going to be astounding. People you never believed would have came to church are going to sit in the row right behind you. Enemies who you thought were so contrary to the works of God. Cousins, aunts and uncles who you thought hated Christianity. God is going to do such a miraculous work in this next season that you're going to see them here in this house. And God's like, if you will believe, I'll use you to be a part of that miracle. Yes, Lord. If you will believe, I'll invite you to be a part of what I'm doing on the earth. If you will believe. Let me tell you, I believe America's greatest days are ahead of it because I believe the church's greatest days are ahead of it. I believe if the church will kneel down and be counted in heaven, then God will raise up the humble and he will make us impactful on the earth. I believe if we will be faithful to call upon the name of the Lord, then he will make himself known. I believe that these 66 books from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 are still true. And if we take God at his word, this is the beginning of what he will do. God is calling his church. God is calling you and I. You may think it's, it's by accident we're here, yet I believe in heaven's calendar, it was divinely set for us to be here, for you to hear this message. Why? So we stop putting it on pastor's back to fill this church, and we say, I have a hand in that. We stop, we stop asking God, God, send another Billy Graham, when God is saying, no, I choose you. God, raise up a, a, another pastor, and God's like, no, I'm going to raise up a daughter. And you begin to, instead of asking God, save us, you say, God, help use me to bring salvation to somebody else. <laughs> Satan has tried so hard to keep the church bound up so that we can't be freed to do the works of the Lord. But all that is shifting when and if we begin to believe. Amen. I want you to bow your heads for a second. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want you to just stay silent in his presence for a moment. Too often we, we struggle with silence because our lives are filled with so much noise. But God wants to bring us back like the disciples to rest a moment. To get re-attuned to the pitch of his voice. We've been fighting so many battles. We've been exhausted in this onslaught of attack. We become tired. And it's, it's hard to use your faith when you're tired. It's hard to believe God for the supernatural when the natural has exhausted you. And so God invites you to come and rest a while. And what he does is when he brings you to this place of Psalm 23, he becomes the good shepherd. 
and that God brings you and he surrounds you with his goodness. He places you in these places where you can be refreshed and renewed. And before you know it, you're at a table and you're eating and you're like, God, I feel so great. And then you raise your head from your dish and you see your enemies are sat all around you. But your enemies are not there to pounce on you. They're there to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living be poured out before you. God is raising up his people in this hour with all the naysayers, with all the contrarians. He's raising it up in this hour to show how good he can be despite the circumstances. Why? Because God wants to raise up a people that will stand up and see the chains fall off before waiting to see the chains fall off before they stand up. God is bringing a people that if we call upon his name, we will see miracles, signs, and wonders happen. Because he's so good that he wants his goodness to us to lead the lost to repentance. And so he's going to show off his kindness and his love and in front of our enemies. He's not going to, he's not going to take our enemies away. He's going to do it in front of our enemies. Why? Because he's so good, he even wants our enemies to come to him. And so God is saying rest. Why? Because we're about to move into a season of action. And he wants to so attune you to the sound of his voice so that you don't get lost like I was, feeling overwhelmed with the circumstances and the anxieties of life that we find ourselves in. And we can be found in him, not powerless, but powerful when we become prayerful because we hear his voice. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word. Many of us have heard the word for a long time, but we forgot to hear his voice in the here and now. Jesus said, I, I, don't, I don't speak unless I first hear. I don't do unless I first see. Many of us have been, have been going on our own, saying and doing whatever we want without waiting for him to lead the way. And God is saying, I'm getting you back into these rhythms of grace so that you can see fruitfulness where you last saw fruitlessness. Some of us, like the disciples, we've been fishing all night and we got nothing. And we say, does this Christianity thing really work? And Jesus is saying, if you just believe, cast out the net one more time and you will see the harvest of your life. Some of us may have been on the verge of giving up and God is saying, don't give up. Don't give in. You already have the power you need inside of you to not only see Las Vegas, but all America rocked with the love of the Father. If you will just believe, cast out that net one more time, believe God one more time, move out one more time, step into that divine purpose and promise one more time, you will see the waves split before you. You'll see the Red Sea get split before you. Why? Because he goes before you and he makes a way where there is no way. Hmm. And you move on the waves that he's already parted for you. It's time, it's time we build our faith up again. It's time we become a victorious church again. We've taken enough L's. It's time we turn them into lessons and we use those lessons as the bridge to victories. Amen. I believe the church is moving into a season of great victory that the world is literally going to be in awe of the God of their church if we pray. If we'll be found faithful to call upon the name of the Lord. If in our own homes we will pray and we'll bring an anointing that comes together as a corporate anointing in this church and we'll see God move then corporately. God is moving in this church because he has found faithful leadership that has humbled themselves to call upon the name of the Lord. And y'all get a blessing because of the waves that have been split and made for you. So I'm telling you, it's time to, it's time to call your friends, it's time to call your family members. God is doing something. At CCLV. There's a special anointing in this house. Bring the lost here. We're going to see miracles. Bring the sick here. God can heal them. Amen. Bring those Amen. that have tried money and saw it's not enough. They'll find more than enough in Jesus. Amen. God, I pray that your heart would be embedded into the heart of your sons and daughters. 
I pray you would strengthen and you would encourage them and you would reveal yourself as Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, as Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, as El Roi, the God who sees, that they would see you and be seen by you, O God. Father, I pray, Lord God, as my brothers and sisters cast the net out one more time, Father, that you would bless their harvest, that you would do the miraculous, and you would empower them and embolden them, Lord God, to believe again so we can see, Father, our families and our neighborhoods and our cities come to Christ. Mm. God, I believe that you are moving now more than ever before. And I thank you, Father, what the enemy meant for our, our deconstruction is going to be the platform for constructing a stronger body. Amen. I thank you, Father, that what the enemy did to try to tear apart this church specifically was just overshowing his cards that he was so afraid of what you would do in this body of believers that he had to stop them before they even started. Amen. So I thank you, Father, that you are making all things work for their good. I think the hand of God is upon not only this church, but the individuals and families in this body. And they will see the hand of God move for them in 2024. Father, stir God, release, Father, an even greater spirit of intercessory prayer in this house. May we be a people that agree with heaven and see heaven come on earth. Mm. We love you, Father. Our eyes are on you. Salvation comes from no man or woman. Only you are mighty to save. In Jesus' awesome, precious, matchless, and undefeated name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate you. Let's give Pastor Mike a hand for that. That was an on-time word, an on-time word, a call to prayer. When I listen to what Pastor Mike is telling us, you know, <laughs> thinking about that, that example of Peter, right? And, and, and it's like there has to be faith and action. You know, oftentimes we're praying for something and, and, and it's like we're free, we're free. But we see the, we see the, the handcuffs, we see the, and you know, we're thinking, oh, we're not. But... We haven't put any faith to that, to, to, to any action to that faith. And, and I don't know about you, but I will never, ever forget the phrase, <laughs> I'm not powerless, I'm just prayerless. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I mean, think about that. When, when you think about all the challenges and you think you're overwhelmed, it's, it's, not a, it's not for us to throw up our hands and say, oh, you know, we're so powerless. No, it's like, our, it's, it's for us to look to see if we're prayerless. And finally, I don't know about you, but it just, it just struck me. I'm listening to this and thinking, you know what, God, you don't want us to be perfect. God doesn't need us to be perfect. God wants us to be prayerful. Amen. Amen. That's it. If we, if perfection's not coming, but we can bring the prayer. So Pastor Mike, thank you for sharing your heart and for just sharing the Lord calling us to a time and, and, and a focus of prayer um, and, and, and we know that but sometimes we just need to be reminded and, yeah. and, and re-centered on our life in prayer.